Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-level chemistry for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of group 7, the halogens, and in particular, on the trends in properties. Hi, I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-level chemistry with our helpful revision resources tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button, and whilst you're watching, please leave any comments down below about anything you're unsure of. If it's your first time watching, make sure to let us know so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the video. Welcome to lesson one of two in this tutorial, Trends in Properties. This is the first video in our series of two lessons on the topic of halogens. In the last lesson, we looked at the trends in the elements magnesium to barium and some of the uses of their compounds. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. First, we will look at the properties of halogens, then at testing for halides. Here are the AQA specification points for today's lesson. Feel free to pause the video now and have a quick read through them before we begin. First, we will look at the trends in halogens. You should know and learn the main properties of the first four halogens. We'll go through them in more detail in this video. As you can see here, the ones we'll be looking at are fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. Let's look at their trends in boiling point, electronegativity and the oxidising and reducing powers of these elements. What happens to the boiling point down group 7? It will increase as we go down the group. As we can see here, the size of the molecules increases as we head down the group. The van der Waals forces are going to become stronger as the size of the molecule increases. As we learnt earlier, the bigger the molecule, the more electrons that are present and therefore the stronger the van der Waals forces. The trend in the boiling points is represented by the changes in the physical states of the halogens going from a gas into a solid. What happens to the electronegativity down group 7? It will decrease as we move down the group. As you move down group 7, the electronegativity of the elements will decrease. All the halogens are very electronegative with fluorine being the most electronegative element. As you move down the group, the atomic radius of the elements increases. Therefore, this is due to an increased shielding effect. This means that there is a reduced attraction between the atoms and therefore the electronegativity will decrease. Here, we can see a decrease in the polarity of the carbon-carbon halogen bond from fluorine to iodine. Now let's look at the trend in oxidising ability. What happens to the oxidising ability down group 7? It will decrease as we go down the group. There is an increased atomic radius, so there is a greater distance between the nucleus and the outer electron. This means they are able to gain an electron. Halogens are found in group 7 of the periodic table, meaning that they have 7 electrons in their outermost shell. This means that when they react, they gain an electron to achieve a full outer shell, just like a noble gas. The reactivity of the halogens is going to decrease as we move down the group. This is because they become less reactive as the atomic radius of the element will increase, meaning that the distance 
between the outer shell of electrons and the nucleus will also increase. There is therefore a reduced attraction between the nucleus and the outermost shell. This is why the reactivity decreases down the group. As the halogens become less reactive down the group, their oxidising ability decreases. Remember, oxidation is a gain of electrons. Halogens become less oxidising as you move down the group, as it is more difficult to gain the electron. The oxidising strength of the halogens can be compared by carrying out displacement reactions involving halide ions. A halide in solution will only be displaced by a halogen that is above it in the periodic table. We'll be looking at the displacement reactions of chlorine, bromine and iodine, as well as learning their ionic equations. Displacement reactions can also be used to identify the halogen present in the solution. To identify the halogen present, you should look out for a colour change and compare it to the table we'll show in the next few slides. Let's fill in this table together. First, we'll look at the halogens reacting with sodium chloride. In this case, there is no reactions with either of them. Next, we'll look at the power of sodium bromide. Here, the chlorine will form an orange solution, which is Br2. However, there is still no reaction with bromine and iodine. Finally, with sodium iodide, a brown solution will be formed, which is I2. This will only be formed with chlorine and bromine. But there is still no reaction with iodine. Now let's look at the reducing ability of the halide ions. What happens to the reducing ability as we move down group 7? The reducing ability will decrease. As you move down the group, the reducing power of the halides will increase. As a reducing agent, a halide ion will lose its outermost electron and the ability to lose this electron depends on the shielding effect and the ionic radius. The greater the reducing power of a halide, the more easily it can lose electrons. As you can see, the atomic radius increases, therefore there is a greater shielding effect, meaning there is less attraction between the outer electron and the nucleus. We've just seen that as you move down the group of halides, the attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons is going to decrease. This is because the ionic radius has increased. This means that the distance between the outer electrons and the nucleus is also going to increase. Additionally, there is a greater shielding effect as more inner electrons are present, which also weakens the attraction. We can use the reaction of halides with sulfuric acid to compare their reducing power. When halides react with concentrated sulfuric acid, a hydrogen halide is produced as an initial product. Other products can also be produced depending on the halides. Hydrogen fluoride or hydrogen chloride gas is formed depending on which halide is used. You can identify these substances as misty fumes when the gas contacts the moisture in the air. Here, we can see that the reaction does not proceed after these equations, as hydrogen fluoride 
and hydrogen chloride are only very weak reducing agents. They are not strong enough to reduce sulfuric acid. It's important you remember that this is not a redox reaction as the oxidation states of halide and sulfur do not change. Hydrogen bromide is a gas formed in this first reaction and it is absorbed by misty fumes. However, in this case, the reaction can proceed as hydrogen bromide is a strong enough reducing agent to react with sulfuric acid in a redox reaction. As we can see here, sulfur dioxide gas is produced, as well as choking fumes, as well as the bromine gas as orange fumes. With sodium iodide, the first two reactions are the same as before. Hydrogen iodide is formed and can be observed as misty fumes. Hydrogen iodide then reduces sulfuric acid because it is a strong reducing agent. However, this time, as hydrogen iodide is an even stronger reducing agent than hydrogen bromide, it can further reduce the SO2 into H2S. Solid iodine is also formed. H2S is a toxic gas with a bad egg smell. Next, we will cover the use of silver nitrate solution. Acidified silver nitrate solution can be used to identify and distinguish between the halide ions. Silver nitrate solution must be acidified using dilute nitric acid first, since this removes any excess ions present in the solution that might react and affect the results. Now we will look at why we add ammonia solution and why silver nitrate solution is acidified. A precipitate of the silver halide will form when silver nitrate solution is added. The colour will help you identify the halide ion present. The precipitate of silver chloride will form the slowest and the one of silver iodide will form the fastest. This table shows the solubilities of the silver halides in ammonia. Silver chloride is the most soluble in ammonia and silver iodide is the least soluble. Finally, we will cover the solubility of silver halides in ammonia. Different silver halides have different solubilities in ammonia. Therefore, we can use this to distinguish between them. Silver chloride is the most soluble and silver iodide is the least soluble. Here, we can see that because the silver chloride ions are the most soluble, they will dissolve in dilute ammonia. However, the silver iodide are insoluble since they do not dissolve even when put in concentrated ammonia. We've now covered all the learning objectives for today's lesson. Feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch anything you are unsure about. We have now completed lesson one. If you liked this video, make sure to catch our latest videos by subscribing down below and leaving a comment on a topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch more videos on our series of A-Level Chemistry or visit our website studymind.co.uk for past paper compilations by topic and specification.